seated and good morning. What we have in today's gospel account that Deacon Bud just read is the story of a nightmare. But unlike a common nightmare that is only a bad dream that ends when the one dreaming wakes up, this nightmare is real and it will never end for its subject. The parable of the rich man and Lazarus is an extraordinary passage of scripture because in it Jesus describes a unique conversation between a person in heaven and a person in hell. And I'm using the terms heaven and hell loosely here and it warrants an explanation. The scriptures and ancient Jewish belief in general make reference to an underworld, a netherworld where all who died went. And this netherworld contained two separate sections, two very different places. One reserved for the souls of the just and the other for the souls of the unjust. The place where the rich man ended up is called Hades, which is the Greek term for hell. But the place where Lazarus was is referred to as Abraham's bosom. Abraham's bosom was not heaven, but it was the biblical designation for the place in this netherworld where the spirits of the just of Israel, the Old Testament saints led by Father Abraham, went after death waiting for Jesus' atonement on the cross to open heaven to them. So while Lazarus was not actually in heaven in the presence of God, he was in a place of comfort and hope and fellowship. The first point that Jesus was making for his immediate audience, which was the Pharisees, was that there was a rich man who was eternally lost and a poor man who was eternally saved. Now, this concept alone would have turned the Pharisees' theology on its ear because they presumed and taught that earthly riches were a direct sign of God's favor and that poverty was a direct sign of God's disfavor. Not that the converse is true, as I'll address shortly, but Jesus sets the stage right off the bat by confronting and demolishing the Pharisees' religious suppositions in order to present the truth. So let's look at it. Verse 19 of Luke 16 implies that the rich man was not only rich, but that he was totally self-indulgent. He feasted sumptuously every day, we read. Now, there's nothing in this account to indicate that the rich man was evil. Presumably, his only sin that we can discern from the parable is one that is implied. Namely, that he ignored the plight of the poor, afflicted beggar named Lazarus, who was right under his nose, laid at his gate, Jesus says. Notice the contrast. The rich man, covered with purple and fine linen, feasting sumptuously in his house every day. And then on the other hand, Lazarus, covered with sores, laying at the gate of the rich man's house, begging only for the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table every day and never receiving them. So pathetic was his plight that the dogs would come and lick his sores. You may remember that in the Magnificat, recorded in Luke chapter 1, Mary had prophesied that her son Jesus would put down the mighty from their thrones and exalt the lowly. He would fill the hungry with good things and send the rich away empty. Notice another contrast. Jesus tells us that the rich man died and was buried. In the same verse, he also tells us that Lazarus died, but Jesus says nothing about a burial for him. Following the common practice of the day, since he was an indigent beggar, his dead body was most likely thrown onto the local refuse pile outside the city. But then comes the ultimate contrast. For at the point of death, Lazarus's soul is carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom, while the rich man finds himself 
in Hades. And then we read this in verses 23 and 24. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy upon me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. The first thing we notice about this is that while the bosom of Abraham was far off, apparently it was not so far removed from Hades that the rich man couldn't see and identify both Abraham and Lazarus. And then in a real twist of irony, the rich man who in life had never paid heed to Lazarus' hunger for the crumbs from his table, in the afterlife he begs Abraham to send Lazarus to him with a drop of water for his parched tongue. Now here's an indication that this man has not yet come to a full understanding of why he is even there. He calls Ab on Abraham as father. In Luke 3, chapter, uh, chapter 3, verse 8, we read John the Baptist's stinging condemnation of the religious pride and presumption that he saw in many of the Jews of his day. He said, bear fruits that befit repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Further on, in the eighth chapter of John's Gospel, the Jews debated their religious status with Jesus, declaring Abraham is our father. Jesus responds, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the work of Abraham. They were convinced that they were justified and that they had a rightful claim to eternal life simply because they were Abraham's descendants. The rich man in the story implicitly made the same claim. In life he had trusted in his wealth, presuming it to be the obvious evidence of God's favor. And now in death he's trusting in his religious pedigree, but both, both have failed him. In the few verses just beyond today's New Testament reading from 1 Timothy chapter 6, we hear a relevant teaching on this very subject from St. Paul. Here's what St. Paul says in 1 Timothy 6, beginning in verse 17. As for the rich in this world, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on uncertain riches, but on God who richly furnishes us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good deeds, liberal and generous, thus laying up for themselves a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of the life, which is life indeed. And of course, he's talking about eternal life. Trust in God, he says, and demonstrate that you trust him by doing his work, which for the man in our story, the rich man, should have included using his wealth to care for Lazarus. The message for us is that the only thing we can trust in to merit eternal life for us is our relationship with God, certainly not earthly riches, and just as certainly not a so-called religious pedigree, if that pedigree becomes a substitute for living in relationship with Jesus. So Abraham reveals to the man how it was that he had lavished good things on himself and thus had, in effect, made a decision in life to let those things be his reward. But Lazarus had no such good things in life, and he is now being comforted and rewarded. Now let's be clear about something here. Jesus is not teaching that wealth in itself is a vice, any more than he is teaching that poverty is in itself a virtue. He is teaching, as in last Sunday's parable of the unjust steward, a kingdom principle. The principle of the proper stewardship, again, of wealth and possessions, which includes a mandate to care for the poor. 
Abraham goes on to tell the rich man that what he is requesting, that, I, that, that Lazarus come and bring a drop of water for his parched lips, what he is requesting is actually impossible because there is a great gulf, a chasm, separating Hades from the bosom of Abraham. Again, ironically, a chasm had also existed in life between the rich man and Lazarus, a chasm created by the rich man's self-centeredness and his neglect, and by the social norms that said that the rich did not associate with the poor. The rich man had the power to bridge that chasm if he had so chosen. But having failed to do so, the chasm that he had created in life became a chasm that could not be bridged in the afterlife. All of our chasm bridging needs to be done in this life because after death, it's too late. That includes our own crossing from sin to righteousness, from darkness to light, and from death to life. There are a number of, re of responses that the parable of the rich man and Lazarus should evoke in us. A commitment, for example, to proper stewardship of our resources. A commitment to help the poor. A commitment to revere and live by the word of God. A continual sense of humble gratitude to God for the gift of redemption. All of these are crucial lessons to be gleaned from this parable today. But the one that I personally have found most convicting, and the one that I want us to take away from this homily today, is the need for us who profess the name of Jesus Christ to develop a deeper sense of urgency about our own salvation and about rescuing those who are headed for hell without Christ. Implicit in that conviction are several realities. Reality number one is this. There is such a place as hell. Jesus himself tells us so over and over again. So don't let anyone tell you enter, en otherwise, even if that person is a priest or a bishop. Don't anyone tell you otherwise. There is such a place as hell. Secondly, those who die in a state of separation from God go there for eternity. And third, God calls and equips those who believe to bring his truth to bear by word and example to the lives of unbelievers in order to bring them into fellowship with God. So think about this then. Hell in one respect is nothing more than the extreme eternal state of those who choose to live life out of fellowship with God and contrary to his word and who then die in that state. Hell, therefore, is not some arbitrary assignment by a cruel and capricious God, but rather it is the natural consequence of the choices that people make in life. 2 Peter 3, 9 says this, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance." End quote. And it is precisely because God does not desire to see people go to hell that he offers a way of escape. You know that that way is Jesus. So let's take this message today and let's let it motivate us and inspire us to an ever greater sense of urgency about the times and about the world in which we live. An urgency about first finding our own way to heaven and also an urgency about helping all we know to find it as well.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.